last couple of verses that we'll consider. Strange days, the rest of the resurrection story. Let's go back to verse 46. And said unto them, Jesus, and we covered these verses the last couple of weeks. Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. We talked about that, about, again, your, your translation probably has something different. But thus it is written, and thus it became necessary for Christ to suffer. The idea being that things that are written in the word are necessary things, that they could no more be written in here and not happen or not come to pass than God could simply lie to our face. Thus it is written, thus it is necessary or was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Just a, a, one thing to note is that just from that language alone, you understand quickly that this is basically uh, the gospel. We're talking about the gospel message here. And so when we talk about the gospel message here, we're talking about something that is very, very important. And again, when you say that a little bit, especially in a room that is, I would imagine mostly Christians, most Christians think I've heard this before. Now, I'm saved, I've heard this before. I don't know that I need to hear this again. And yet we do. There's just no disputing it. We do. And what we'll talk about this morning, I don't know how else to say it, is very, very important. But Jesus said it was, it was and by the way, let me just say this. The poor people in the music, right? The people who, who do the music, just pray for them because they work with me. And that's not a great thing. And they're always trying to be very, very helpful and say, why don't you tell us what you're going to preach about? Yeah, I mean, it's been said, if you'll let us know ahead of time, we can arrange songs for that. And I'm like, I should probably go home because I, I, I just, I, I'm not like that. I'm not like that at all. I wish I was. Which makes mornings like this so much more interesting to me when all the songs line up pretty much exactly with what I wanted to preach about. That's a, that's a, sort, of, a sort of Christianity voodoo that's kind of, neat and it makes you look forward to what's actually going to happen. Not that I believe in voodoo, mind you, it's just an expression. So here he goes, he says this in verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. So again, we talked last week in verse 47 about repentance, a word that is often forgotten in our culture, a word that is forgotten even in churches. And yet a very, very important work. And we'll talk a little bit more, not really more about it, but I just want to say a couple passing things about it before we move on. But then we're going to talk about something else this morning, and it's the other R word there. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And so let's just start by remembering a couple of things. We were talking about this last little bit, this last little section of verses that describe the very end of Jesus' time before we get into the book of Acts, the very end of Jesus' post-resurrection words to his disciples. And so we get to verse 47 and we see that he's giving his disciples a strange mission. That's what we talked about last week and it began with hopefully we have here a strange word, right? It's a strange message, a strange word was repentance. And understand this, when we talk about repentance, there's a couple of things to notice. All I want to do is establish this. Most people are familiar with gospel words like grace and forgiveness, right? That idea of of mercy and so forth. This is not one that is so remembered. When we talk about people coming to Christ, and we talk about people being saved, we talked about this last week, we often don't, don't include this anymore. That repentance of sins is so very necessary to the gospel call. I just have these verses to kind of demonstrate what we're talking about. Luke 5.32, Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to what? Repentance. Yeah, not faith, grace, or mercy, although that's part of it all. We just can't forget this notion of the idea of repentance. For as certainly as sinners are called to grace and mercy, we're called to repentance, right? We talked all about that word last week, but also you have in Acts chapter two, verse 37 through 38, now when they heard this, they were pricked after their hearts, right? This is Peter's great Pentecost message. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent. Not have faith, right? Not receive grace, repent. That was the first thing that he recommended, or he instructed, I should say, after his great Pentecost message. Repent is that first answer to the first question of the application of the first sermon ever preached. Get that. 
Peter's Pentecost sermon is the first sermon ever preached in the Christian era. The first question that was asked afterward is what shall we do? And the first answer is repent. Also, you look at Acts 17, it says this, and the times of this ignorance, this is Paul speaking, God winked at but now commands all men everywhere to repent. It's not to the exclusion of grace and mercy, it's just that it's part of the same call. We can't forget that, right? And so the command of God is for all people, again, not just to find forgiveness or mercy, but of repentance. All of it, certainly. But we've forgotten or left off repentance, typically. In Acts 26, you have this. <laughs> what does that say there? Acts 26, 20, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Right, I'll read the whole context, the whole verse here for you. I didn't have room on this slide. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles, all the people who heard, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. And again, that's a fine definition of the gospel is that there is first that repentance from sin and then there's that turning to God and then the works meet or commensurate with repentance. And this is something that we said last time as well, just in passing, and that is that repentance always brings about a change of behavior, always, it just does. It's just the way that it goes. You can't separate it out. And so just wanted to reestablish before we move on that repentance is as much of the gospel call as anything. It's an integral part of the gospel call Going back to the beginning, I think our ears are full of the essentials like love, mercy, and grace, and we need to remember repentance and how important it is and how central of a place that it takes in the gospel. Having heard that, let's talk about the next R word here in verse 47, where you find a strange solution, and that is remission. Remission. It's another strange word, right? Right? Strange days, strange word, it's, it's, it's strange, and we'll show you why here as we go through this. Again, it's interesting to me that the first, most common terms employed to describe the gospel are some of the least used and least understood. How many of you heard of remission of sins? How many of you think you could write out a great definition for what remission of sins means? Here's what, something else that's interesting about this as well that you should keep in mind, or at least you, you, uh, I'll keep you in mind because I'll probably be preaching about it sometime soon, is all the rewords that are involved in Christianity. And what I mean by that, all the essential words to our faith that describe our faith, what happens and, and what it means, begin with the prefix re, R-E, means to do again. But here's just a selection. We just talked about what? Repent. We talked about, we're talking about this morning, remission. We're talking about, in other cases, reconcile. There's redeem, there's restore, there's regenerate, there's renew, there's revive, there's resurrect. That is not, by the way, by accident. Those are all words that have very sig great significance to our faith and what it is doing in our life. And it will, it will we'll see. I got so many things I wanna preach, I don't have time to preach them all. We go back, it, show, it throws us all the way back to Genesis, all the rewords. But here's one of the most important, and that is remission. The idea of remission is a strange solution. It's a strange solution to our problem. It is, first of all, understand this. It's a word, understand the word. It's a Greek word, aphesis or aphasis, and it means liberty or pardon. Liberty or pardon. But most of us think of remission as a medical term, probably more related to cancer than anything else, but that really isn't the best way to understand remission here, although it's not terrible, it's just not the best way. Because a lot of time a disease, typically cancer, right? We've all known people that have suffered this. It's a great tragedy in a lot of people's lives, but even after remission, cancer can come back. Sin does not go into remission that way. Sin doesn't come back on you. The penalty of sin is never revisited upon you. So while remission in the sense of the medical term isn't a terrible way to understand it, it's just not complete. It means simply this, liberty or pardon. The English definition of remission is this, along with all other, a couple of others, you can find this one down the list a little ways. The older definition means the cancellation of a debt. That gets a lot closer to what we're talking about. Remission. 
Look at what it said here. Repentance and remission of sin should be preached. That's good news. I mean, that's the heart of good news, isn't it? That sins can find remission at the cross of Christ. But here, put this, that both of those words better, the idea of cancellation of debt or liberty or pardon, communicate the idea expressed here, namely, that the debt of sin will be canceled and that people can be set free from both the bondage and the penalty of sin. It is possible. It's possible to find remission, the cancellation of the debt that we owe God because we are sinners. And that's what Jesus said the message is going to be. Here's your message. Here's your mission. Go and preach the strange message with this strange solution to the problem that exists between us and God and that strange solution is remission. Because understand this, and this is what I, what I mean to say about strange. Understand this, that there's basically, I would say, two kinds of religious thought in the world. Two kinds of religious thought in this world. There is, first of all, there's first of all, people who believe in God, but don't believe there's a real or dire problem between people and God. You know what I'm talking, you understand what I'm saying there? There's people who believe in God, but they don't believe there's any real problem between us and God. God just loves everybody. God just kind of there, kind of rooting us on, cheering us across the finish line. When things go bad, he's the first one to reach down and pick us up. There's no expectations. There's no problems that exist. There's no separation between people and God. We just need to get up and brush ourselves off and do it all over again. And this was, this was a real problem in the days of the New Testament because this was a lot of this type of thinking. The empire was riddled with state-sponsored cults that glorified the emperor. Right? There was some of that going around. And there were local gods that provided divine protection for cities or trades. You saw this when Paul threatened the livelihood of silversmiths in Ephesus that were making those idols for the temple of Diana. You saw that there. There's gods that people, if you wanted to have a job, you had to go worship at this, at this trades god at the temple. That's a problem. And they weren't really angry with you. They weren't saying, oh, you know, there's problems with you. They just wanted your Devotion, they wanted your money, and everything would be okay. There's, there's that kind of religious thought that says that there is no problem between us and God, really. It's just that we aren't being our best selves. There's a lot of religions today that would preach the greatest sin is that we're not living our best life now. That we're not the person that we could be. That we haven't lived up to our potential that's the problem God has. It's not that there's any breach of relationship. We've just done ourselves wrong. And all God wants is for us to feel better about ourselves and to reach the potential that we've habitually fallen short of. That's the first kind of thought. Second kind of thought is probably closer to our orbit in people who believe in God and admit there's a problem between people and God and they offer a solution. The one doesn't see a need for a solution because everything's really fine. We just have to be a better person and we're only cheating ourselves. And if we would just realize that we're cheating ourselves, we'll get better. There's a second kind that says, no, there's a problem. There's a problem between you and God and God is not terribly happy and we have a solution. That's the other kind of thought that there is. And of course, there's always been religions like this, some that you know and some you've never heard of. They've come and gone and some have stuck around longer than others. But in the days of the apostles, Judaism was one of those types of faiths. There is a problem and we have a solution and the solution is sacrifices. The solution is pilgrimages. Solution is righteousness of your own. There's a problem and here's a solution. And it goes beyond that, though, to all sorts of religions that you've, again, sort of probably been around even in these days. And they all have different details, I suppose, but in general, they all come back to the same thing for their solution. Here's the thing. All of the things, all of the faiths that say there's a problem between us and God, and we have a solution, all of their solutions come down to one thing. Works. All of them. In fact, here, I got some quotes for you. Here's some, I guess you might say, sort of uh, some quotes about what some of the major religions believe about what happens when a person dies. Okay? 
For example is this. Here's a quote from Islam. This is what they say. On the last day, resurrected humans and gene will be judged by Allah according to their deeds. One's eternal destination depends on balance of good to bad deeds in life. That's Islam. What is it? We have all sorts of problems with Islam, but if you're just checking out faiths, what does it say? It says you've got to have more good deeds than bad deeds in life. It's that simple. And then you're going to find some kind of paradise at the end. You go on. Here's what Buddhism says. According to Buddhism, after death, one is either reborn into another body or reincarnated or enters nirvana. Only Buddhas, those who have attained enlightenment, will achieve the latter destination. What the Buddha says happens when you die. Buddhism says happens when you die. If you haven't achieved the rank, I guess, of Buddha, if you haven't achieved enlightenment, when again, notice it's on you to achieve enlightenment. It doesn't just fall upon you. You have to achieve it. And if you do, then you can stop this whole sort of, sort of circle of, of, of being reincarnated and so forth. But it's works. Here's the last one I've got for you here is Hinduism. Try and make sense of this. A basic understanding of salvation articulated there. Human beings continue to be reborn because they continue to generate karma, and they continue to generate karma because they are ignorant. They are ignorant of the true nature of the self, according to the Upanishads. If one knows the true nature of the self, that it does not in any ultimate sense exist, then one will stop grasping. If one stops grasping, then one stops generating karma. And when there is no karma, there is no rebirth. One is released. I'll give 20 bucks to anybody who can make sense out of that. Right now, I'm serious. We'll give you the morning offering if you can make sense out of this. It's like a jackpot. You can't, it's like a noun verb preposition gumbo. You can't make sense out of that. And it's like the second largest religion in the world. And it follows the same path of every other other religion in the world which says there's a problem between us and God and here's our solution. You can call it by Islam and talk about a balance of good deeds. You can call it by Buddhism and say that there's gotta be sort of enlightenment achieved. You can call it by Hinduism and whatever that means. But it all comes back to this. It's about works. It's about what you do. It's about what you achieve. It's about what you come to understand. It's about everything about you. That's why This is a strange message, and it's a strange solution, because remission has nothing to do with works. It's got nothing to do, in fact, notice what Jesus said, and that repentance and remission of sins and good works, no, here's the only message, repentance and remission of sins. That there's a turning away from sin, like we talked about last week, and there's a turning to God, like we talked about this week, for the remission that is promised in the cross of Christ. Here's lesson 10. We've been taking lessons, right? I'm sure you've written all of these down. I'm sure you've got them all memorized, amen? Here's lesson 10 is this, I think. Keep Christianity honest and it will remain strangely unique. What happens is we stray from the path of true Christianity. We want people, here's, listen, and, 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 okay, before we move on, just let me say this. A lot of times we want so much for people to be Christian that we don't press them to see if they actually are one. I've warned people about this for a long time. You ever, you've probably heard this before. One of the first things somebody told me, says, well, of course they're a Christian. They go to church. You ever heard this? Well, if you walk into a garage, are you a car? I mean, that was like back in 79 I heard that. If you go into a garage or your car, you know, you can sit here every single Sunday. You can hang out with Christians. You can have a Bible. You can carry it with you. But if you've never repented and received remission of sins, you're not saved. It's just that simple. But what happens is we so want people to be saved that we don't question them too hard or we don't look too much at what they actually believe. We just hear a few words and we're happy. And, and, and when we ask people if they'll be a Christian, we say, it's no big deal. Just say this prayer. No, no, it comes back to the idea of repentance. Keep it honest, 
Honest Christians say we must repent of our sins and we must turn to God for the remission of our sins. It's still a strange solution because it still has nothing to do with works. We talked about that last week, about how repentance isn't really about us and works. But how is Christianity strange? It's this way, it begins by admitting there's a problem, right? Christianity says there's a problem. The other ones say there's a problem, but it isn't so much about how bad we are, it's about how, how good we should be. Christianity says, no, there's a problem, and it's sin. And I'm tell, I was thinking about this just, just, this just the other day. I was thinking about when I first started preaching and I said the word sin, everybody knew what I was talking about. I mean, you didn't have to convince people they were sinners. It was not hard at all. That's different today. It's, it sounds so weird, but we have to first tell people about sin and that they've got a problem with it before they can know that they're lost and need to be saved. Christianity starts by admitting that there's a problem and the problem is about us, but it also goes on and it says this, it offers a solution not based on works that procures or produces a confidence and that is remission. Not in the remission of sense of like a medical definition where what is in remission might come back. It's remission in that there's a cancellation of a debt. <clears throat> you guys know this, right? You know, the, you know the, the verses in Romans about the Romans road, what does it say? For the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. And you know what's interesting? It's very strange. A number of these rewords that relate to Christianity have almost an economic background. The wages of sin, it's what you've earned, right? The debt that's incurred before God because of sin that we can't pay. We always say Jesus paid a debt we couldn't pay, amen? Right? We talked about redeem. That's an economic word. Yeah, you start looking at this, and there's, there's because it's, it, the only transactions that occur are those type, where it's one way. And this is the thing that we've got here. Remission in all the world through all time. Understand this. There has never been a message that is at once so honest and so thorough with the solution. So honest that says, now you're not a good person. None of us are. We lost that ability from birth. None of us are good people. But there's good news. Jesus died for you, that you could receive the remission of sin. It's, it's, it's just that simple. Christianity tells the world we do have a problem with God, that there is a separation between us because of sin, but we also have a solution because of God's love and because it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. He has paid the penalty for that sin. He has paid the debt. He has canceled the debt of that sin and has remitted them. In short, I'm gonna put here, Christianity says we have a problem and we offer a certain solution. Did you also notice in the other quotations from other faiths that there's no certainty? Nobody says what the balance of good to bad is. Okay? Nobody says exactly how to attain enlightenment and that you know it when you die. Nobody comes along and explains whatever that paragraph was and whatever it's supposed to mean. Nobody says it. it's all gobbledygook. Christianity says, no, you are lost. But God showed us his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And what I mean is what Jesus is sending these apostles out into the world to preach is strange. It's the strangest of things when you think about the other faiths that are out there competing against it. It's a strange solution, not only because of no other faith offers it, but because the solution is, is so complete because it is based not, not on anything that we can do. You can't earn it, you can't be good enough to keep it. The message of remission was something unheard of in Jesus' day and remains a complete bafflement to the world today. That's what's, this, this is the strange thing too, is you preach this idea of remission from sins apart from works and people look at you like a calf at a new fence. Because what appeals to us as people is helping ourselves. What appeals to, if we got ourselves into this, we'll get ourselves out. We'll pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We don't need anybody help. That's why pe you see people running to this notion of works. You see people going, making like Hinduism the second largest religion in the world because it just all sort of makes sense that we should be sort of co-helpers in our own salvation. The Bible says, no, you can't. It's been all paid by Christ and Christ alone. 
That's what makes it so different. And it remains to this day a baffled. Again, you ever wonder why when you, when you witness to somebody, they don't just jump up, hug you around the neck and say, yeah, that's what I want. It's because it doesn't make any sense. What are you talking about? I, I don't do anything. Surely I have to do something. I mean, surely I have to be a good person. Surely I have to deserve it. No, 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 no. Not at all. Strange message. Strange solution. A strange word, repentance. Strange solution is remission. But there's one last thing, and then we'll be done with the whole thing. That is this. There's a strange love that's expressed in this verse. A strange love. It's, it's sort of a reckless love. I wonder if you ever noticed this before. Look at verse 47. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. What struck me is that word, Jerusalem. And look at what he says, beginning at Jerusalem. Remember where we are. Remember, we're just a, we're, we're a day off, really, of Jesus' resurrection. I know we've been here for three months now or so, but this is still the day after. It's sort of the day of, the evening of, and so forth, if the timeline's correct in our head. And what happens is, is that Jesus says, you don't understand, he's gone through all the stuff that he's gone through, Moses and the prophets, right, revealing all the stuff written concerning him in all of the Old Testament, and that it was written, and thus it behooves Christ, and so on and so forth, and this is the message that I want you to preach, repentance and remission, and oh, by the way, there's a starting point. You don't just go on out here to any place. I want you to go to Jerusalem, and I want you to begin there. It's interesting if I recall, in the last 36 hours or so, Jerusalem is the place where Jesus was betrayed. Jerusalem is the place where Jesus was slapped by Roman soldiers, where Jesus' beard was pulled out of his face, where Jesus had to listen to people crying for him to be crucified and let a murderer go free. If I, if I recall correctly, maybe you recall correctly with me, that Jerusalem was the place where Jesus was beaten by soldiers, where Jesus was taken and made to bear his own cross up to Calvary. And on the way, if I recall, through the streets of Jerusalem, it was in that city where people and Jewish leaders mocked him, spit on him, where they took him and they nailed his hands and his feet to a cross just outside of Jerusalem. If you go back and if you think about it, absolutely, utterly, every ugly, sadistic, and unimaginably cruel thing, where did that happen to Jesus? It wasn't Nazareth. It wasn't Bethlehem. Every sadistically cruel and unimaginably ugly thing happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. Folks, that's a strange love. Take the message of repentance and remission of sins into the, all the world, but start, start at the place that murdered me. Start in the city that rejected me. Start in the streets where I was mocked. Begin where my blood began to spill from my back and from my brow. Begin in the city where the inhabitants live who beat me senseless, that put a plaiting of thorns across my head. Begin there. Don't leave it out. Don't make it fifth down the list. Don't come back when it's safe. Take that message and walk into Jerusalem with it. And that's what I have up here just in a couple of ways. It's a strange love. It's a reckless love that makes the epicenter of treachery and human cruelty the first target of remission. You can go back to the Old Testament. Almost all the bad and nasty stuff that happens to the God's people begins in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, take this message there first. Here's the last lesson, lesson 11. There is no substitute for strange love. You can have an incredible message. 
You can be on an incredible mission with an incredible message, with an incredible word, with incredible hope. But if you don't have the strange love, you risk becoming a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of person. It's easy to have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. It's easy to get caught up in doctrine and semantics. It's easy to sort of line out point by point what it is we believe or, or, or what it is or the problem with people and what God has made the solution. But here's the deal. Jesus didn't say, now just keep this to yourself. We said last time, they didn't just go home. Here's your message, here's your mission. And go straight back to the place that, humanly speaking, deserves at least. This message means nothing without love. This message is ineffectual and neutered without a strange kind of love. A strange kind of love I put like this. A strange kind of love where it takes no account of the type or degree of sin in a person's life to share with them the truth whether it be individually or as a church. Listen, it takes no account of the type. Well, some sins are acceptable, and we don't mind these people getting saved, but these over here, we don't want these people here in the message. Doggone it, they're getting what they deserve. And sometimes that can come across, whether we intend for it to or not. If you're a garden variety average sinner like me, okay, well, then you can be forgiven. But if you're a rotten, nasty sinner over here, unlike me, then you have to, you're kind of out of luck. We're not going to waste time on that. Seeing how degrading and abusing the Son of God was no bar to being offered the message of remission is an example for us. Jesus didn't say, you know what, those folks in Jerusalem, they get what they deserve. He said, go there first. Strange love also never thinks of the lost as being unworthy. You know how often Christians think of sinners as being unworthy? We have a great message You don't have to work your sins away and you don't have to be uncertain when the time comes to meet God. You can be certain and your sin debt can be canceled forever, right? But are there anybody that we think is unworthy of that? Ah, they've messed up. They've messed up my life. They've messed up this. They've messed up that. They're not worthy of it. Seeing how the first people to be offered this message were the ones who murdered Christ. I don't think anyone is unworthy. Jesus said, take this message to the people who just killed me. No one's unworthy. Everyone needs to hear, whether it's individually or us as a church. And also this, strange love isn't swayed by the fear of man. Seeing how the first people to be offered remission in Christ were the very people who had sentenced him to the cross, Jesus tells his disciples, They might be looking for you. They might not understand you. They might apprehend you. They might put you in prison. They might kill you, but go back to that city. Go back to that city and offer them these words of life. Tell them that repentance and remission of sins has come. Tell them that they can be right before God again. Tell them they no longer have to wonder They no longer have to work. There's no more need for sacrifice. There's no more need for pilgrimages. This is a message of grace. And go offer it to them. It is a love that cannot be explained by human emotion or logic. A love for the unlovable, a love for the ungrateful, and a love for the needy. Based simply on the fact that they are separated from God. That's what we should be looking at. That's the ultimate strange day. It's the ultimate strangeness after Easter. The strange mission, the strange message, and a strange word, and a very, very strange love. Father, this morning, I'm grateful to be able to preach about the love that you have. A love that we cannot understand. A love, honestly, that comes from you through us to sinners. Lord, all around us, we're thinking of people, I suppose, we have in the back of our minds, we'd never say it, that there's people unworthy. But help us never to, Father, live that way. Help us this morning to come before you grateful for the message of life and remission, that we no longer have to work for our own salvation and we never have to be uncertain. And Lord, help us as a church.
that have a very strange love that wants to see this message preached to even those who, like us, are ungrateful for hearing it, are uninterested in hearing it. Lord, help us to see them as people just like we once were and in need of this remission, we pray in Christ's name.